Okay. Let me uh, just review briefly this etiology thing. Look, if you go into, let me get back to my skin eruptions, a dermatologist, and you have bumps, and that dermatologist measures the height, the width, and the depth of every bump to the nearest thousandth of a millimeter, still doesn't tell you why you have bumps on your skin. Still doesn't tell you what to do. What causes them? Is it an allergic reaction? Is it this? Is it that? Who knows? Is it an allergy? Is it an infection? Is it a fungus? Is it a yeast? Is it a, I don't know, is it something autoimmune kind of thing? So if I get very exact measures of what kids can and can't do, it still doesn't tell me why. Now let me talk about attention deficit disorder a little bit. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, what I used to look at the end, right? We look back now at practices certain cultures had and were horrified. In China, there was foot binding. We're horrified by that. That women's feet were bound so tight that they didn't grow because small feet were considered beautiful. Right? And they became basically paralyzed. That's why you see the pig, the, the carvings in China of the empress being carried around in, you know, because she couldn't walk. In 19th century Europe, this bell glass, this hourglass figure was considered proper for women. And they would have corsets that were pulled so tight that they would actually cause structural damage to the body, deform the rib cage. And some people looked at skeletons, said, and, and there were also diseases reported. Clearly, Organs being impinged upon, even being punctured by these things or being moved out of place, we're horrified by it. I am convinced that 100 years from now, people are going to look back and say, you know, at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, Americans decided there are only certain kind of personalities that they would tolerate. You had to have a certain kind of personality to go to school. And if your kid didn't have a different kind of personality, they pumped him full of drugs until he had it. Just say no to drugs and take your Ritalin. There's been a reaction now against the drugs. Kids being pumped full of Xanax and other kinds of drugs. Drugging up our children. It's just, to me, it's horrifying. If you read the Goodman and Poyon article, and I'll tell you, I'll just sign that article until I retire, right? So I have a faith that this will still be. You saw that there are many, many, many different, often contradictory reasons given for attention deficit disorder. Okay. Again, none of them, no one says, kids don't pay attention because they're bored silly. Okay. He's going to get mad at me, I don't care. That son of mine who just won the Emmy, boy, he just didn't make it in school. They wanted to put drugs into him. He is the, the, the symptoms of attention deficit disorder and the characteristics of the creative child overlap enormously, well over 50%. If you give the creative the kids a lesson to do to weigh certain objects in a scale, it's the creative kid will start taking apart the scale to see how it works, not weigh the objects. That's attention deficit disorder, right? Kids get bored. Want me to start giving you a lesson in Hebrew grammar, the 10th lesson in the book? See how long you can pay attention. All right? It's the 10th lesson in the beginner's book. So you can pay attention. Anybody in the room know Hebrew? I know there's one person who does, right? I talk to him in Hebrew. I give him the tenth lesson in the book, he's gonna get bored to tears too, in the Hebrew book. Because it's really elementary. I mean, his Hebrew's pretty good. At least from my perspective, <laughs> My Hebrew used to be really good, it's not anymore. I use it off and on. So here are two people sitting like this. One, because she doesn't know what I'm talking about. One, because it's so elementary for him, he can't stand it. Before you know, they're fiddling and they're moving and looking for something else to do.
have diagnosis from symptoms. There are a lot of reasons why kids don't pay attention. Who knows why? Are they bored? Do they know what's going on? Let's take a little vote here. How many people, when you were in class, if you were given a math sheet to do, here we're going to have to do 35 or 40 problems, the same thing over and over again. You may have hated it, but somehow you couldn't imagine to sit and get through it. How many people just couldn't stand it? You went out of your tree and you began doing something else. Who could sit through and do it, more or less? And how many people just couldn't? Yeah, about a fourth of us. Oh, ADD. I mean, please. That's the 19th one, I, you know. Either you know it or you don't. I couldn't stand it. How many people here, to clarify an idea, need to sit back and think it through? And how many people need to talk it over with someone else? Who needs to sit back by yourself and think it through? And how many people need to talk it with somebody else? That's closer to 50-50. The talkers, ADD, what are you talking to people about? Right? <laughs> People have different personalities. The other thing that I gave you is boyhood a disease. It's getting more and more that way. Running around, having fun, you know, screaming, it's all ADD. Now let me tell you something. <clears throat> Just because a p pill stops the person from doing something or gets the behavior you want doesn't mean the person's sick. Okay? Let's, let's say you're doing something, it's the same task, a repetitive task, over and over and over and over until you can't stand it anymore. You're getting me like that. Let me pump you full of Ritalin, you'll be right back to being able to do it. I mean, you pump people full of drugs, right? Pump people full of Benzedrine and Dexedrine, they'll be able to do it. Anybody ever see anybody overdose on Benzedrines? I know nobody here, but you know, those are the drugs you take to pull all-nighters three in a row. I had a friend who did it. Three nights in early study, got three A's and three F's on his finals. He had the crash, right? And the drug wasn't working anymore, and he was just so different, right? I once saw a woman, she... I was living in the East Village in the 60s, where all the hippies were, and she took, I think it was a, a Dexedrine. I mean, she, was, she bought two chickens. And she was plucking the chickens, feather by feather. My feather. We were watching her, right? Because we we called the doctor and said, just watch her. As long as she's doing it, if she's, they gave us symptoms to rush her to the hospital. But I, so we said, you know, it was a bunch of us lived in a, it was apartments that we all rented. We all knew each other. You know the pin feathers, the little thing in the, in the legs, the little teeny tiny pin feathers, just kind of wash them off? No, each one went for hours plucking the feathers out of this chicken. I wanted to scream, right? She was high in drugs. Cocaine's the same thing. They all work the same in the way in the brain. I can't come up this. It's, it prevents people from the uptake of dopamine in the brain. How many people have heard the following? These have a... You understand that these, the Ritalin is, uh, is a stimulant, that it has an anomalous effect on kids, right? It stimulates adults, but it slows kids down. Not really. Not really. It has the same effect. When adults get bored with something and can't pay attention, they go like this. Kids go like this. Start running around, they go nuts, right? It's very interesting. It's an interesting thing, uh, just a little aside. Mammals, the young of virtually every mammal, play. They play. And they'll play together, right? You get a little kid and bear cubs, they'll play together, OK? I, in the, I, knew, I knew the guy, I think, I think still is the associate curator of the Brownsville Zoo. They, when you have single infants born to, um, to apes, they get along, you know, it's, it's not good. Okay? They need to play, it, and, and if they start to play with the adults, they can get hurt. So they had a, 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 a gorilla and a chimp. Okay? Gorillas and chimps don't get along, in case you're interested, by the way. You know all those sweet little chimps that you see on TV? They're all babies. When chips grow up, they are rotten, rotten, mean, dangerous, miserable animals, right? Matter of fact, he took me for a private thing in his, we're driving by the, driving by the chimps thing, 
You know, it's an open, so he says, you got to watch that one ship in there is really mad at me. She gets up and she burns it, she comes in, and then she picks up a big chunk of chimp droppings, and she heaves it at the truck. Right? He said, duck! Bang on her gave it. And they're strong. I mean, she really threw that far. But the, but the, the chimp and the gorilla played with each other until they were babies. So they got it. See, they need to wrestle and to play and to do stuff. Otherwise, they're not going to. They'll do it all the time. By the way, you have to be very careful of that. I was at worked in a camp once where the cubs came in to the camp. And uh, the kids were playing with them. The ranger heard about it. He said, are you nuts? If that mother shows up, she'll kill the kids. So when infants, mammal infants, and humans are mammals, yes, even politicians, don't ask, don't ask me that question, OK? I'm going to make that joke over and over again. I don't care, especially during election season. Yes, this tape is during elections. I'm sorry. When, you, when, they, they, when, when they get bored and can't take it anymore, they get up and run around and play. Children do. Adults tend to go like this. So it basically has to say it stops that boredom reaction by stopping the normal chemical process in your brain that say enough already. So you can get people to sit and do something that would ordinarily bore them to tears by pumping them full of drugs. It's evil. It's evil. We used to have a guy, he retired now on our Bob Craig, who authored one of the right one of the books that I may or may not have assigned to you. He said, Why don't you say what you mean? And he had a lot of training in theology, right? And he said, it's evil. Why don't you say it? I'm saying it. It's evil. To say, we're going to only accept certain kinds of personalities. How many have had the following? Has anybody ever worked as a counselor in a summer camp? Yeah? Did you have all kinds of kids who were supposed to be pumped full of drugs? You didn't give them the drugs and they were fine? She's going like this with a smile. Oh, yeah. Both of them, three of my four kids were counselors in summer camp. They all reported that. You have a kid, oh, this kid's ADD, oh, this kid's did You get the kid in your class, fine with me. It's the personality. It's the personality. I have cured many children of ADD by telling the parents, get them out of there, send them to this private school or that private school. I used to have a list of them when I was doing more of that stuff. have to wonder. Plenty of kids who are ADD in a regular school are not in a Montessori school or in a constructive of a Piagetian school. So you have to wonder. Okay? And in the end, it's easy to pump the kids full of drugs. See, see, I told you. Pump the kid full of drugs, kids paying attention. You have something you have to get done and you're like this, go find some kid on Riddle and take the Riddle and you'll perk right up. I promise you. So what we have is a bunch of circular explanations, all kinds of contentions without evidence. There's no evidence anything's wrong with the brain. What's wrong with kids who are ADD? How do you know? Right? I call it BT, BTD, boring teacher disorder. Right? Or ICD, idiotic curriculum disorder. How many times have you been forced to teach stuff that you could barely say because it was so boring? Who's had that experience? Come on, raise your hand. No? Oh, man. Some of the stuff in here, some of the stuff like memorizing the periodic chart of the elements. Have you lost your mind? Chem chemists don't know the periodic chart of the elements, especially in order one, two, three, instead of up and down, where there's at least some logic to it, bivalence. It's just boring. Some people like that. Okay, let's admit, how many people like diagramming sentences? I love it. I'm the only one? Who never had a diagram a sentence? Oh yeah, you like to do it, two of us, right? I love to do it. How many people like to watch car races, the auto races on TV? I would rather watch paint dry. I cannot stand it. How many people 
feel that you are psychologically incapable of watching commercials. Oh, the guys, raise your hand. Come on, all the guys. You liar. That's a the flip, 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 flip. My wife says, stop it already. I said, like, right? I can't stand commercials. I got to do something else. Right? Other people, how many people kind of like watching commercials, see stuff, what's going on, they're neat? Yeah, other people. You know that show that they have of the most interesting commercials ever made? I hate that show. <laughs> it's commercials. Get it out of there. Can't stand it. My wife says, oh, look, it's cute. Change the channel. <laughs> so, I, I just, so, different things interest and bore different people, right? In particular, when we tell every kid, this is the book everyone has to read. Why? Why can't I read a book that interests me? Of course, it doesn't matter, just get the cliff notes, who cares, right? But, you understand? Yeah, go ahead. Um, loud, talk loud. Have you, um, I guess, heard about this new um, thing that they've researched? It was in another country, but they basically are equating um, the hours um, watching TV between the ages of one and three with a 10% increase. With a what increase? 10% increase in ADD, or risk to have ADD. And their explanation is that the children get used to seeing things that cartoons are so fast moving that they get their brain trains itself to see things fast moving and so when the real world isn't fast moving that that's why they're they have ADD first of all it's a correlation so I don't know of course of course the first question I was asked is is there a difference in families that have the kids watch a lot of television versus families that don't have a kid who watch a lot of television? Does that have something to do with it? So, I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know. You get all these correlations. I don't know. Of course, baby, television is bad for kids. Like the Discovery Channel is terrible, right? Sesame Street is terrible. I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting kinds of stuff. I don't know. I mean, people have been knocking television for so long. I don't know what to say. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, the point is, what if there are kids who need fast-moving things? So what? Why does everyone have to have the same personality? Go ahead. Um, are you saying, like, maybe teachers should just let kids learn what they want to learn? It's a thought. Wait till we get to the humanists. Why not? It's a thought. Certainly, would look... Look, this is going to be in a tape, but what the heck? You know, it's off the path. Look, the, I, I was an American history major. July 4th, 1863 was the day that decided the Civil War. That's the day that Lee withdrew from Gettysburg and the day that Grant captured Vicksburg and basically cut the Mississippi and the South really couldn't use it too much anymore, okay? From then on, it was just a matter of time, okay? I had a degree in this stuff. That I knew. I didn't have any idea whatsoever, none, what actually went on the Battle of Vicksburg. I finally went to Vicksburg and got a tour, and I remember a little bit now. I know nothing about Gettysburg except Pickett's Charge. I don't even know anything about that. And something Hill that the Union held, that's how they did it. I can't remember the name of it. I didn't know anything about military history, nothing. If you want to know what's going on in America today, if you want to get an insight into America in different generations, what's the thing to look at? Commercials, right? Pepsi for those who think young, you remember that? Obviously we're obsessed with youth. Then there's this one thing about the soldier is coming home. And his mother comes running, and she's about four foot seven, he's about six foot six, right? His mother comes home, and they hug, and they kiss, and they're causing each other. And it's a commercial for windows. <laughs> I looked at what is going on here? And I realized it's, it was family is what counted, right? 
We had in the 70s, we were afraid of commercial in the 80s, our families were breaking over. It's social history. I knew one guy who said, you want to understand America, forget the political history. I had one professor, the social history. All right? The f I still remember what he told me. The first deodorant ever was called Odorono. <laughs> and their slogan was, turns your armpits into charm pits. I swear. In the 1920s, I think, and it was the start of the gay 20s in America and really what we have obsessions, so to speak, with grooming and bodies and all this kind of stuff. It showed a fundamental shift in American culture. We're becoming less a hard-working, sweating, farming, laboring culture into more middle class. He said that's where you can start to see the shift in the commercial. So if one kid says, look, I'm bored with this paper, brothers. let me write about the Battle of Gettysburg. One kid says, I want to do something on the fashions. Did I do the thing about you have 10 seconds? Okay, you're sentenced to death in the future. But there's one way to get out. You're, in a, you're, you're going to go in a time machine. And they're going to put you back into a closed room. You can't see out the window, no door, no windows. You're in the room and you have 10 seconds. You have a newspaper with the front page cut off. You have 10 seconds to say whether you're in a period where outside the economy is good, the economy is bad, the economy is so so. If you can tell, give the right answer, you'll live. If not, you're executed. I could do it, no sweat. Ten seconds flipping through the paper. What would I look at? The advertisements. Exactly, I'd look at the advertisements, advertisements. And I, there's one big thing, there's one, no, I wouldn't look at big ticket items. That'd be a little hard, because I always advert. I would look at women's fashions. Skirts up, good times. Skirt lengths down, bad times. Showing both, not so sure. The gay 90s, the roaring 20s, the 60s, way up. And the depression, way down. At stagflation of the Carter years, way down. During the beginning of Reagan years, you saw both. Right? Remember that, the long suit coats? It was like a suit with a short skirts. That was a sign of it. Then they went up again during the Clinton years. Remember that? Now we'll see what happens. So it's, social history tells you an enormous amount. So why not? Okay, so the question becomes, what? okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Listen, all failures are blamed on the child whether it's behavioral failures from your perspective or achievement failures. We maintain without having any, any evidence to substantiate our claim that something must be wrong with a student, generally a sensory modality. And that's why the kid's not achieving. And when we ignore science and accept explanations, even though there's no evidence to support them, then the floodgates are open. I already said that. Okay? And we have crazy manipulated skull bones, read through, poke a hole in the paper. We get all kinds of stuff. Anything goes. Once you've run that science, anything goes. Make it up yourself. I don't know. Eat alphabet soup. That'll cure it. Okay? The question is, what about meaning? Meaning. The kid doesn't understand what you're talking about. It's always sensory. It's auditory process. Oh, the kid can't do it. Draw, draw a hole in the kid's back, right? Who's heard this one? People with dyslexia reverse letters. Heard that one? How many people have taught kindergarten? Or first grade? Anybody? Yeah, you have? Say that again? Substituted. In, in kindergarten? Have you seen kids write? How many of them re reverse letters? Push it down and say it. Almost all of them. All of them. Then I can come up later. All kids reverse letters when they start reading. I can come up later and say, uh, Mr. So-and-so, when your kid first starting to write reverse letters, right? So yeah, I told you. They all reverse letters. Say, so, well, kids who are done let's say do it more. Well, why? By the way, the cure for reversing letters is to make kids write script. You never reverse letters when you write script. So what? How many people hear reverse letters or numbers once in a while? <laughs> I 
They read things backwards. I'm going to show you the world's true dyslexic. Who, who brought the book? Who brought the think book? Who has the think book? All of you take it out. Okay, Sam, open to a page at random. Open to a page at random. What page is it? 141. Okay, everybody open to 141. Now, here's what I'm going to do. You can check on me. He's going to read me. Okay, you have to push it down so you can hear. They can hear. You're going to read a sentence out of the book. Okay? And I'm going to read the sentence back to you saying every word backwards. Start at the first new paragraph on the page. If education is to aim at developing the total structure... Okay, here we go. If education is to aim at developing, okay, fear no it no it could be, right? No or no it could, is to aim si at mia ta ginipol ved, right? At ladat what? The total what is it? <coughs> structure, structure or root kurtz. Am I right? Am I saying every word backwards? You want to know how I can do it? I have no idea. One day, when I was a kid, Davy Crockett was the big thing on the Disney show. Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. So I'm there singing, Eva, Eva, take off Nick Fudd, Larry at North, that's Davy, Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. Backwards. I was 10 years old. I mean, my father comes and says, what are you doing? What's that? I said, I'm singing Davy, Davy Crockett, saying every word backwards. He said, how can you do that? I said, well, everybody can do it. He said, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm the world's true dyslexic. Interestingly enough, I, I, if you ask me what do I do, I say, I see the words in my head and I read them backwards. I knew one other person who could do it. Remember, her name was Linda. But she did it by sound. So if you had the word here, let's go to the overhead. If you had the word sick, I would say, Kiss, right? She would say kiss, say kiss, because she would do it backwards. You understand what I'm saying? So if you have the word this, she would say sid. I would say sit. I'm reading it backwards, right? So actually we were, co we were sort of co-leaders of a youth group. We said, oh, we're going to fool the kids. We'll talk to them in this, right? Couldn't do it. Because <laughs> I couldn't understand what she was saying, she couldn't say what I was saying, right? I don't know why. I, don't, I said, how can you do it? She said, I just hear it and say it backwards. But she was good. If you get a five-syllable word with me, I can't do it. She, she could do ethnicist establishmentarianism backwards. Huh? It's hopeless with me. And after it gets, I can't, it's too big for me to see in my head. And, I don't know how I can do it. We have all kinds of videos. How many people here sometimes reverse numbers when you write them down? Write it down. Raise your hands. Yeah, we got a, more than half the class. Anybody here leave out a letter when you're handwriting? Is there a certain letter you leave out? I leave out what? Vowels. Push it down? Vowels. It leaves out vowels. I leave out P's. I don't know why. <laughs> Especially if there are two P's in the word. Like if it's puppy, I write it. No, puppy has too many P's. If the word is pipe, I write P-I-E, pie. I, when I go back to read it, I see it. We all have idiosyncrasies like that. So what you get is things like, well, some people with dyslexia reverse letters, and some don't. And some people don't have dyslexia reverse letters, and some don't. Interestingly enough, the same thing that is true of, in, of attention deficit disorder is true of learning disabilities. There are dozens and dozens of symptoms. Right? So what I have here is my list of symptoms. Here it is. This is my note with my list of symptoms. Okay. Who's my LD kid? Who was the LD kid? Somebody was LD when you stood in the front of the room. I was retarded. No, you were retarded. <laughs> were you LD? You were LD, right? Yeah. Okay, here's the kid. No, just sit there. Can you get the camera on us? Here's my list of symptoms. See, there are 100. Come on. Okay, kid, make a move. It'll be something. So we have things. So, first of all, we have some things that are just flat out, that are just flat out circular. Trouble spelling. Well, obviously. 
<laughs> right? That's what we mean by doing so you can't do stuff. Disorganized. Let me tell you something. To say that I am disorganized is like saying the Pacific Ocean is damp. <laughs> the Mount Everest is a bump in the ground. I never had any trouble reading. Never had any trouble. I was really good at that stuff. Academically, I was fine. <coughs> Not Lack of coordination. There was one woman who I remember wrote an article for a society I used to belong to in which she talked about how she had learning disability and she had trouble balancing and riding a bike. Well, I have terrible trouble with balance, too. I read fine. And Greg Louganis, anybody remember Greg Louganis, the Olympic diver? He was supposedly diagnosed with dyslexia. He looked pretty coordinated to me. <laughs> Won a bunch of gold medals. <laughs> I think it was a pretty coordinated human being, right? I mean, please. So we have this symptom and that symptom. And everybody has symptoms with dyslexia. And by the way, we could have two people with learning disabilities. He has 12 symptoms. She has another 15 and they don't overlap. Meanwhile, I have 10 of hers and I'm fine. You pile on enough symptoms, everybody has them. And we still don't know why. And we still insist upon blaming on the kid. And we refuse to discuss meaning. Here, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Refuse to discuss understanding. Okay? If we're going to maintain that every time a child does not learn it's his or her fault, then we have to make the following assumptions. Ready? There's a perfect system to teach all normal children. Okay? We have perfect knowledge of this system or systems. And we always implement it perfectly. We know exactly what to do completely and we always do it perfectly. Therefore, my conclusion is, any child who does not learn must be abnormal. If any of the propositions one, here, let me use the mouse, one, two, or three is not true, then the conclusion is not valid. I know I'm not supposed to use red on TV because it bleeds, but I don't care. Once in a while, I put it there, and I can see it doesn't look so hot, but there. Are you sure that you're not doing something wrong? Are you sure we have perfect knowledge of how kids think and learn? Are you sure that the curriculum was developmentally appropriate? We know darn well that we have problems. Are you sure the kid has the required pre-knowledge? Let me get two more people here. Yeah. Okay. Tell me your name. Heather. Heather. And? Again? Allison. Allison. No kidding. I had a good friend whose daughter's name Heather and Allison. You guys aren't sisters, are you? <laughs> Heather and Allison are illiterate. Don't panic. They're only six years old. Take it easy. They're just coming into first grade or middle of kindergarten. Don't panic. They can't read. Heather has never seen a book, has never seen anyone read, doesn't know what reading is. Just never seen it. Allison, she's seen her parents read. She asks a question. She said, oh, wait, I'll look it up in the book. I'll read. She's been read to. So when I say to them, okay, and I'm going to teach She's illiterate. She can't read. If I say, I'm going to teach you how to read, she says, oh, he's going to teach me how to play that game. She doesn't know what I'm talking about. She knows books can tell you stuff. She's never seen one. She knows you can get information by reading. She doesn't know anything about it. Would it surprise people that Alice, Allison, right, is having less trouble than Heather? Wouldn't surprise me. Does the kid have the proper pre-knowledge? Okay, give him a big hand. Good job. Now go learn how to read. Okay. Does the kid have a proper developmentally appropriate? We're going to see theories that are worrying about those. Okay. Does the kid understand what reading is, what the meaning of reading is? I'll tell you a story. Got a guy my reading teachers on mess and comes and says, I gotta tell you guys a story. We were the Piaget boys, the developmental boys. I'll just tell you this story and then comes up, he says, uh, I asked a kid, the kid was this was a, a nursery school, three or four years old, I said to the kid, um, What's reading? He said, oh, how does the teacher read? He said, well, tell me what happens. He said, well, the teacher opens the book, and the book talks to the teacher. 
So he says, the teacher hears? They said, yeah. The book talks to her and tells us what she tells us what the book says. So he says, well, can you hear it? He said, no. If you got close, you could hear it? No. He said, only the teacher can hear the book. The book only talks to the teacher. So he says, so anytime the teacher opens the book, anytime the teacher opens the book, she can hear it talk to her? He said, oh, no. No. It only talks to her by the piano. So he went and asked the teacher, what happened? Is that in back of the piano was a, they had some chairs, right? She would push the chairs back, right? And the kids would sit there and open it, and she'd sit on the piano with her back to the piano and read to the kids. They'd sit on the floor in front of her, right? So that's the only thing we talk. And he asked the kids, so, so if the teacher takes the book and opens it by the desk, can she read it? He said, no, won't talk to her by the desk, just by the piano. Well, you've got to wonder if that kid understands what reading is anyway. Maybe. What are you going to teach the kid? So you have to, you have to worry about it. Okay, so let's, let's go back here to the PowerPoint. The question is, are we really perfect? Tell me your name again. What? Jennifer. Jennifer. Jennifer, I remember. The way Jennifer said. We can't say what's wrong with the kid. We've got to ask what's wrong in general. Maybe there's something wrong with us. Are we perfect? I've got to talk to you for a second, by the way, after class. Is it fair for the child to be blamed every time that he or she doesn't learn? Is there no responsibility to examine what we do? Is it moral to do whatever we decide to do and then say the kid has a disease every time we do not succeed? I'm going to do what I'm going to do, the way I'm going to do it, and if you don't get it, you're sick in the brain. Any evidence? Yeah, you couldn't do it. Come back to me for a second. I'm not saying that there's a lot of misdiagnosis of LD. I'm saying the term itself is worthless. I'm not saying that there's misdiagnosis of ADD. I'm saying the term needs to be thrown away. It doesn't mean anything. If a kid's not paying attention, find out why. Are you asking me whether I think there are some kids who have trouble reading because there's something neurologically wrong? I'm certainly open to the possibility. My guess is yes. Are you asking me whether there are some kids who can't pay attention? My guess is yes. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you my rule and I'll tell you where it comes. There used to be something before ADD hit something called hyper, hyperkinesis, right? And these were kids who almost from the beginning, they couldn't sit still. I knew a kid like that. In the old days, I was dating his mother. He never sat still for a minute. I would bring her home, didn't matter what time. One time, I had a flat tire. I know, it sounds like a lousy excuse, but I really did have a flat tire, right? We get home and call up the babysitter. It was almost 3 in the morning. We hear him in his room, throwing blocks, bang, 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 bang. One time I saw him, I think I finally figured out what it was. He was, he was, you know, he, could, he was two, maybe one and a half. He would sit down to eat. And he would eat a couple of things, and he would jump out of his chair and run out and start to cry. And come back and say, I realized he was hungry. He was crying because he was hungry, but he couldn't sit down long enough to eat. I mean, I couldn't ask him, but I think that's why. It was unbelievable. He would sleep for a couple hours, then get up again, sleep for a couple hours, and get up again. She told me around 3 o'clock he'll fall asleep usually, and then he'll sleep four hours or so, and then he's up. And blah, 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 blah. I mean, it could drive you nuts. He was a nice kid. And he, by the way, and he was an interesting kid, too, that, you know, I told, he, would, like, he would go into his room and throw blocks at everything, but never anyplace else. He just knew in his room he was allowed to do that. But it was just... Lieberman's rule of thumb is, if nothing is wrong with the kid, noticeably wrong with the kid, that kid had something wrong with him. If there's nothing noticeably wrong with the kid before the kid gets to school, either in the behavior thing or in the learning thing, then probably whatever is wrong, whatever is wrong, is a result of the interaction between the kid and the school. And it's not fair to put it all on the kid. Okay? By the way, I want to tell you one thing about, I forgot to tell you, the, who, who was retarded? You can't make somebody retarded just from an IQ test. Because a lot of kids were retesting retarded, and there was nothing wrong with them. 
they got along, they played, they this and that. Finally, people began to say, hey, this is nuts just because of this test. So you have to have other things there. Behavioral tests like the Vineland scale and other things. So it has to be a broad, broad range of things. But for years it was done that way. Okay? In the end, putting it all back on the kid, we're going to try to educate you, but if, if whatever we do doesn't work, it's your fault. Even though you seem to be a perfect normal kid when you got here. You know that there are some places where 50% of the kids in school districts are labeled with some kind of label or another. Tell a parent, kid walking out the door, your kid's going to be labeled as something wrong with her or him. 50-50 chance. Now, some of the labels are supposedly good labels, gifted, etc., but you have to wonder. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. I'm going to finish this tirade pretty soon. Okay? The question is, are we really perfect? Is it moral to just do whatever we decide? And I think it's not. I think it's evil to blame the victim. I can't teach you something wrong with you. I don't have to examine anything I'm doing. Nothing wrong with me. Or do we need to understand how kids learn and develop? Do we need to examine our teaching practices? Do we need to remember that every child is an individual and that it's our responsibility to educate each one of them? Okay, the purpose of school should be to educate kids, not to test, sort, and control them. It should be abundantly evident to you by now the Texas schools don't care too much about educating kids. They want to test them. The tax test and the tacky test. Can you really read Mark Twain and pull out from that? Can you read? Can you read War and Peace and feel the pathos and the upset? It's a long thing to get through. Anybody ever see the Cheers thing? Where Sam reads War and Peace to try to impress Diane because she has a boyfriend. Because she has this professor, she's mean to part, and he says, let's talk about war and peace. You know, he goes, he said, ah, I don't want to talk about that old boring stuff, right? But it's, you know, the pathos that goes into Russian society, right? Can you read stuff from the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement and feel the, I remember I had to do that for one class, the anger and the hope and the hopelessness all put together by, by, by Baldwin. Man shall not promise that you ought to read that. Right now it's a history book. It's, it's, I mean, it was really so, so powerful. I'm not going to tell you the end, but it's just oh, shocking. Anyway, can you feel the agony when you read the diaries of Philip Warsaw? I've been using history because I knew that stuff. Can you get in and see, is it just memorizing a bunch of stuff to put in the test? Or can you try to get the sense of what science is about? We don't seem to care about that anymore. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. In order to educate kids, not to just sort and control them, we need to understand how they think and develop and learn. And that's going to be the purpose of the rest of the course. Okay? That's what we're going to be doing for the rest of the course. We're going to get off of this side of the Great Divide and go on to that side of the Great Divide. Now, this is supposed to be a course in development, and then we have another course in learning, but as per usual, I don't care. I told you what's under my, the caption of my high school yearbook, right? Whatever you say, I disagree, right? I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. So. I'm going to introduce you first to theories that are generally considered non-developmental, but in fact have a different approach to development. The first thing I want to do is talk about learning theory. Okay? And then I'm going to contrast it. I'm going to contrast it with what I consider more classically developmental theories. And what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be looking for the issues that I talked about in the beginning. What motivates people? What causes people to learn? What doesn't cause them to learn? Why do some kids fail? None of those questions is asked. None is, right? Well, no one, one is. None of those questions is asked by the testing establishment, by the testers. There's never a why. Here we're going to look at why. Why can't people learn? What's going on? What's the source of the inability to learn? And we're going to see a lot of vigorous disagreements about theory and about practice. <coughs> you already got a hint. <coughs> a lot of people's theory will tell them, 
You need to develop effective strategies when a kid can't do something and intervene to get him to learn. My first instinct is to back off. <coughs> because I have a developmental approach, a Piagetian approach, I say, wait a minute. And I worked with a lot of kids who had learning problems and adolescents and young adults. Come back and say, whoa, wait a minute. <coughs> I've got to, I want to see, right, if the kid is knows what I'm talking about, the kid's developmentally ready. <coughs> so we'll get to that and we'll see it, but at least we're going to look at some things. Some of these theories I like, some I don't like. So let's start now. Again, I tell the people on the tapes, I, I'm, I want to spend, a, I'm, the lectures aren't divided neatly because I, I want to, you know, because I'm going to spend more time than some things and less than others. So let's start on the learning theory now. Okay, let's go to the PowerPoint. I'm going to talk about classic learning theory, which is called behaviorism. While behaviorism is not in vogue today, wait a minute. Sorry. Ooh, I have nice PowerPoint stuff. Talk about learning theory. I'm particularly going to. Particularly. I'm going to, I want to talk about behaviorism, okay? Now, while I want to talk about the behaviorism of B.F. Skinner. Now, while most people will claim not to be classic behaviorists today, I'm going to take a drink, thank you. The influence of behaviorism is felt very strongly. Hey, it's vodka, thanks. It's felt very strongly uh, today in schools. For instance, here, come back to me for a second. How many people have been told in order for a kid to learn something, you have to have a demonstrative behavior that shows what you're doing, right? Mm. That's left over from behaviorism. How many people until when you make your goals, you can't have goals like learning and thinking. You have to have a specific task that the kid is going to accomplish. Who's had that one? That's behaviorism. Okay, that's left over from behaviorism. It is at the root of much of what goes on in the school today is learning theory, and indeed, it is the theory that inspired social learning theory and, and um, information processing theory that is um, more common in school today. It's at the root of both of them. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, you found a microphone. Go ahead. So is it dealing with specifics? What? Is it just dealing with specifics? You'll see. Deals with specific behaviors. You'll see. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. We have, so I'm going to talk, there are a lot of it, but a lot of learning theories. Well, I'm going to talk about Skinner since he's been the most influential American American in education. Okay? Behavior is also called reinforcement theory. How many people know what a reinforcement is? Raise your hand. Who knows what a reinforcement is? Who's never heard the term reinforcement? Not one clean. So I'm glad you know because I can't figure it out, but we'll get there. Okay? Behavioral psychologists, classical behavioral psychologists study beha observable behavior, what causes behaviors to change. <coughs> And in pure behaviorism, all mental constructs are viewed as being irrelevant. Okay, so we have terminology here, and almost all of you know this terminology. Okay, we can go down now. I can put my picture in there. Reinforcement. Reinforcement is defined as an environmental stimulus that increases a behavior. How many people never hear the word, have never heard in teaching or in teacher preparation, reinforce the kid? You've all heard that, right? That's right from here. Okay? A punishment is an environmental stimulus that decreases behavior. An extinction. That's a de decrease in behavior by failing to reinforce it. Just don't do anything. Okay? That's the terminology we're going to need here. And we're going to build behaviors. As I said, it's, we're not going to go into this in great depth, but I want to give you an idea here. Okay. Now, Skinner talks about naturally emitted behaviors. This is the contribution of, of biology. He says, the environment shapes naturally emitted behaviors. It is shapes innate behaviors. We don't acquire original behaviors from the environment. Okay, come back to me. Okay, there's a kid. You tell me how you think a kid acquires the sounds in his or her native language. Who here can speak a language other than English and sound like a native? Yeah, what do you, what do you speak? Push it down. I speak three languages. What? 
I speak Urdu, Pakistani language, and Pushto. So if you speak Urdu or Pakistani, people think you're a native, right? Yes. Okay? I speak Vietnamese. Yeah? Say, so how, how old were you when you got here? Um, ten. Ten? Yeah. Okay, pretty good, because you don't have an accent in English either. Who else? Me. Push it down. I speak Russian. Push it down? Yes, I can speak Russian. Russian. Okay, that's it. So, how do people acquire the sounds of their native language? Okay? How do they do that? What? Say it again? Environment where they live. The environment? Well, how does it happen in the environment? Go ahead. Go ahead. Red Baseball Camp, tell me your name. Uh, Daryl. Uh, they hear it. They hear it and they? Practice. They practice it. They do it. They imitate what they hear, right? Right. Skinner says, <laughs> wrong. He says, we never acquire any original behaviors from the environment. The environment just shapes our original behavior. So how would he say that we acquire, that we, why we make the sounds in our native language? Go ahead. Doesn't it have something to do with in utero? Yeah. Here's a baby. The baby can't talk. How is it that, that this baby, I used to be a baby, that I make all the sounds in English, okay? How, how can that be? What happens? And Boris makes all the sounds in Russian. And if I practice, okay, and, and tell me your name again, I forgot. Ilias. Again? Ilias. Ilias, right? Ilias. Ilias? Yes. Ilias can make all the sounds in Urdu and Hindi. Urdu and Hindi are basically the same language, aren't they? Almost, Almost the same language, yeah. Okay, and tell me your name? I'm Gia. Again? Gia? Gia. She makes all the sounds in Vietnamese. Is that it? Vietnamese. And nobody, anybody else? Nobody can speak Spanish like a native here? There you go. You can speak Spanish like a native? Oh, no, no. No. Not. If you speak Spanish, what kind of accent do you, accent do you have? I mean, but, but I mean, will people think that you're a native speaker? Uh, no. no. They think you have an American accent, huh? Close, but no cigar, right? Eh? Okay, but they obviously speak like natives. Okay, what's Skinner going to have to say? If you don't acquire, how is he going to have to say that we all make different sounds from different languages? Go ahead. Those are the sounds that are reinforced. Exactly. He maintained, people thought he was out of his tree, that everybody, every infant is making all of the sounds in all human languages. Some are reinforced and some are not, and you stop making the ones that are not reinforced. So when you say to people, I'll, I'll pick on Boris because he and I had a conversation. He's been in the United States a long time, 20 something years, right? So when you say to him, you can hear that he has an accent, right? So you say to Skinner, well, how can that be? He's been here, now he gets reinforcement for making this on. Doesn't bother him. He says, well, your nervous system develops at a certain point, and after a certain point in your nervous system, right, late, sounds that were never reinforced before, it's too late, you can't make them again. So it doesn't bother him. Okay? Now, this is strange. We, th there are some strange sounds in English. Who can give me a, a sound in English that's very strange? You hear it in very few other languages, maybe not at all. Go ahead. Push it down. The uh, TH. Right. There are, two, there are two CH sounds in English. There's a th, like think, and a the like that. Th, th. That sound is pretty weird. Th, th. You have that in almost all language. Th, you have. Like in Arabic, you have a th sound. But that th sound you don't have. That's why people say tink instead of think. Right? Or dis instead of this. It's tough. I'll tell you another one that's really weird. It's our R sound. R. Languages either have the R sound 
up here, rrr, they trill it, or somewhere in your throat. Rrr, rrr. How is it in Russian? Rrr. Rrr. Push it down and say it. Go ahead. Rrr. Rrr. It's trilled. How is it in Urdu? Re. Re. It's trilled also. Here it's trilled in a different place. He trilled it farther back. Okay. In Hebrew, it's rrr, down in your throat. Rrr. Who else speaks now? How is it in Vietnamese? Um, it depends. It could be both, actually. Let's hear. Let's um, hear. Them. You want to hear a soft one first? Uh, uh, let me hear an. Uh, okay. Yeah. Rong. Rong. See, she's trilling it or. Ra. Uh, farther back, almost in her throat. But this squinching up your face right here and going. Ra, almost nobody can do it. I had a student from Saudi Arabia. She said, You have to teach me how to do this. She tried and tried. I said, If you let me touch it, I'll teach you how to do it. I said, Okay. I took her face on like this. She said, No, do it. She couldn't get into her throat. She walked around for two days like this, got her head on her face. I said, I, I can't stand it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Right? Can't stand it. Okay? So that... But Skinner was saying that everybody, infant is born making that crazy sound. There are other sounds, like click sounds. There are click sounds in the, some languages in South Africa, not too many. But the click is that... It's not a click with your tongue, it's in your throat. I actually saw my son make that once, my oldest son. He's got his mouth open, I could see his tongue, and this big click comes out of his throat. Right? And when people Skinner first said that, they thought he was out of his tree. I told you that. Then along came a little machine that could prove whether it was right or wrong. What machine would you use to determine whether infants, obviously not right when they're born, but when they begin making sounds, they're making sounds in all the human languages? What? Say it. Push it down. Push it down. Nothing to push down. Tape recorder, not the push down. Tape recorder, very good. People left tape recorders by infants cribs. He was right. Even infants born congenitally deaf made all the sounds in all human languages. He was right. This was one sharp cook. I don't agree with anything he had to say, but this was one smart fellow. Okay? So let's go. Behavioral education then. For behaviorists, the purpose of education is to effect desired changes in the learner's behavior. Behaviors, they're trying to change behaviors. And mental constructs have no place in the behaviors classroom. We're just changing behavior. So, by the way, let me just go about the talking. Come back to me for a second. So he's going to say, your ability to perform skills is just reinforcing your natural movement behaviors, right? Everything is just... So let's go back here. So here, here's Skinner's list of evil words. These are words that should never, ever be in behavioral goals because they don't point to specific behaviors. And you're going to see a lot of you have e either been told not to use these words or been told if you use these words, they're inadequate. Here, first, okay, they're never to be used. They're evil words. First, we have cognition. Words like think. What do you mean think? That's not a behavior. Who can give me other ones that you can figure out if you have What would be a word that we usually think about in education, something we want kids to do? It's no good. It's not a specific behavior. No. Fully. Anything else? Understand. Analyze, interpret, learn, evaluate, decide, comprehend, learn. It's all nonsense. So you can't say for Skinner, the child will learn the multiplication tables. No, fooey. The child will be able to say the multiplication tables between the ones and the tens in, fifth, in, in three minutes, making no more than two mistakes. Or the child will write the multiplication tables. So you have to say. Now, okay, likewise in cognition here. Affect. You know this word affect? means emotion. It's a psychology term for emotion. Okay? Appreciate. Feel. Enjoy. Curiosity. Interest. These words are all fully free will, believe, etc. They're all free will. He even wrote a book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. So those are just meaningless words. What we need is behaviors. Has anybody ever... Now, some of you are told it's okay to use these words, but then you have to operationalize them. So it's okay to say the kid will understand something, but then you have to tell me the specific behavior that will show that the kid understands it. Who's been told that? 
So basically, you're being told, understand it's no good. It boils down to a specific behavior. Behavior, how are you going to know? Accountability if you have a behavior. Okay, I'm going to torture myself. Who was the first person in Major League Baseball? If you were not born in the United States, you're off the hook. Otherwise, if you don't know this, you're culturally deprived. Who was the first person in Major League Baseball to steal 100 bases? I know I'm cheating, I remember. The first person, wasn't Ty Cobb, he sold 94 people, thought I'll never be here. Who was the first person, what? Say, no, not Willie Mays, Willie Mays could have been here. Push it down. He said, Lou Brock, not bad, he was the second one. First one was Maury Wills for the Dodgers, and Lou Brock broke his record, I think it was 104 and 110. The only three people ever did it. And who holds the major league record for stealing? We just played until a few years ago. So, go ahead. Ricky Henderson, I think it's 130, right? Ricky Henderson. Okay. Now these, who never heard of Lou Brock and Maury Wills? Get out of here! I only have four papers to correct. What's the matter with you? All right. By the way, I want to tell you something. The greatest base runner in the history of baseball was Jackie Robinson. He was playing in an era where you didn't steal. Jackie Robinson, he, was, he led the majors about every 24, 25, because which is different. If Jackie Robinson were playing in the base single, he would have sold 150 bases. I'm telling you, easy. You know the rundown play where you're caught between bases? You're out 99% of the time. He was out more than, safe more than he was out when he got caught in those plays. He was an unbelievable athlete. Anyway, he's one of my heroes. But in any case, for various reasons, but the fact that he was a great baseball player is one big one. <laughs> okay, in any case, okay, when Maury Wills and Lou Brock would slide, what part of their anatomy, anatomies, went into the stolen base first? Go ahead, we got it. Tell me your name. Dave. Dave, Dave bless you. You like baseball, huh? Good for you. Their feet. Feet first. They were two good base stealers. Okay? The greatest. And Ricky Henderson, what part of his anatomy? Hands first. Okay? He was already playing in the day where everybody had $72 million contracts, and I won't trump on your hand if you don't trump on mine, right? <laughs> Hands first. Lou, by the way, Pete Rosa was also a very, very good base runner. Hands first. The best base runner for a long time. The fastest base runner on the Astros was Biggio. Probably the cleverest, the best base runner. That's how Wills did it. He was just a clever runner. There were a lot of people who could run faster than he could, but he was clever, right? Michio, feet first. I mean, you know, it depends. A guy's slide for feet. So the behaviors are different, but the skill is the same. Does everything boil down to a specific behavior, a partic particular score on a, ta on a tank? So behaviors maintain that none of these evil words must ever be used in the classroom. What happens today, it's sort of so, well, you can use the words, but then you have to get a behavioral objective in this so we can see it. One behavior everyone has to demonstrate, rather than say, well, you know, she demonstrates it this way, he demonstrates it that way, and he demonstrates a third way, and she demonstrates a fourth way. Well, Wills goes feet first, this one goes head first, the other one does this way, right? Some, some people slide feet first, have an over-the-bag slide. They slide into the bag, and then they catch it with their hands. Here's if you see him as a pop-up slide. He slides and it pops up, right? There, there are a lot of different behaviors that you can use, okay? Now, educational behaviors must be stated in behavioral terms only. So education means changing behavior, and we have a lot of that. Look, look, it's this simple. If your definition of education is the score on the tacky test, then everyone has to demonstrate the same behavior. What is it called? The tax test to tacky test. Okay? This is what you have to put down on this thing. Now, and this is often called behavior modification. I'm modifying your behavior because it's all there. I'm just channeling it the way it belongs. Now, I have to tell you something. Reinforcement always increases behavior. Punishment all, and extinction always decrease behavior. Okay? I'm saying this because the schools, come back to me, 
purposely use the terms, because they don't like to use the word punishment. So we say, okay, you talk too much, I'm taking away your recess so you won't talk anymore. That's not negative reinforcement. That's punishment. I'm trying to decrease the talking behavior. Okay? So let's just look at this. Let's see if we can get this done. So we have reinforcement and punishment. We have reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement and punishment. And we have positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Now, positive and negative don't come from, oh, it's good or it's bad. It comes from what I did. It's adding something and subtracting something. If Skinner had asked me, I would have said, call it, here, let's go back here. Sorry, additive reinforcement and subtractive reinforcement. Additive punishment and subtractive punishment. But for reasons that are not clear to me, he didn't ask me. I don't know why. Well, I wasn't around when he did this. So, remember, reinforcement always increases behavior, punishment always decreases it. So, positive reinforcement is adding something to the environment or to increase a behavior. Adding something. This is the one we know most about, okay? Oh, you do what I want, here's a piece of candy. You do what I want, here's a piece of candy. You do what I want, here's a piece of candy. And you keep doing more and more to get the candy. Or here's a new car, here's a new car, here's a new car, right? Or here's $20, $20, $20, right? Subtractive, negative reinforcement is subtracting from the environment in order, to, in order to increase behavior. Come back to me, I'll give you the classic example. Okay, here's the classic example. I'm coming back, I'm coming back. This is a cage. There's a wall down the middle of the cage that goes halfway up the cage, okay? And the wall goes to the ends of the cage. And there's a rat in the cage. My behavioral goal is to get the rat to jump over the wall. So what do I do? The floor of the cage is an electric grid. Pull the lever. I don't know if we could do it today. Well, and the rat runs around like crazy. and blah, blah, blah. Jumps over the wall. It goes off. When the rat does what I want, I take away the stimulus. Give the rat a chance to call its cardiologist. Take it easy. Turn it on again. Before you know it, turn it on. Bang, the rat's over. Turn it on. Bang, the rat's over. Right? We do that in school, too. If you get at least a 90 on the test, or if you wash the boards for me and do this, you don't have to do your homework tomorrow. I'll take away something you don't want in order to get the behavior you want, right? Likewise, let's go here. Positive punishment is adding something to the environment to increase behavior. Let's come over here. Let's come over here. Here, I'm going to take this and go like this. And it goes like this. Go ahead, keep doing it. That's no good. Go ahead, keep doing it. Pick up this book. Bang! I smash his hand. Go ahead, do it again. Bang! I smash his hand. If he stops, if he stops, see, I'm adding something to get him to stop. Only two knuckles are bruised. That's okay. Okay, you understand? Subtractive punishment. Let's go back to our PowerPoint here. Subtractive punishment. Subtract something the environment in order to decrease behavior. Oh! You, did what, you didn't do what I want? I'm taking away a nickel from your allowance. Stop doing that. You're, you're talking. I'm taking away 10 minutes from recess. Talk more another 10 minutes. Eh, okay. Skinner didn't like punishment. He didn't think it was effective. I'll show you why. Okay. Come to me. Right here I am. Going to punish you. Come here. Bang! You smash my hand. Who has this overwhelming urge to kill me now? Annoying people, bang, you smash my hand. Finally, I stopped doing it. Come the next day. Come here, bang, you hit me in the head, right? Come here, again. bang, you hit me in the head. Okay, stop doing it. Come the next day. I was good at that. I could make the windows rattle while I was in middle school. Oh, boy. I was the class jam. Goes on, so you stop punishing what you want. It drives you crazy. You never know what I'm going to do with my hands. Come the next day, I'm slapping the kid in front of me, huh? flicking his ears, right? Finally, one day I pick up a pencil. Oh, reinforce that. Reinforce what you want. Don't waste your time with what you don't want. We'll get to that. Okay. Now, here's some interesting things. Okay, Skinner said the si increasing the size of the reinforcement increases the likelihood that a person will engage in a behavior. I'm more likely to wash your car for $50 than for 50 cents. But you have to be careful of satiation. Okay, ready? I say, okay, I see you one day. Okay, come back to me. 
I see you one day dabbling in the bucket and saying, gee, let's see what it's like washing a car. I give you a million dollars. Wash my car the next day, I give you another million dollars. Every time you come and wash my car, I give you a million dollars. Million dollars, million dollars, all right? Three years later, I give you a million dollars. Chump change. <laughs> I'm a multi-billionaire. Take your million dollars. I'm not going to wash your car for a million dollars. It's nothing. Right? Oh, here's a piece of candy. Here's a piece of candy. I can't stand another piece of candy. That's called satiation. Right? You know, Skinner's got his rats in the box hitting on the, hitting on the bar, right? Most of you know about that. It's a graduate class. The animal gets full. It doesn't want to, it won't hit the bar anymore. It's not hungry anymore. You have to be careful about that. Okay? So the size of the reinforcement, a bigger reinforcement, the better, but you have to be careful that it's, the reinforcement of the skin is not so big that the animal, you don't want it anymore. Right? If I give you a new car every time you do something, how many new cars do you want? I got 57 new cars. I, I don't want another one. Okay? Now, what we're going to have to do, what we're going to have to do is look at what Skinner calls schedules of reinforcement. Reinforcement is okay, but there are different ways to give reinforcement. And the way in which reinforcement is presented has a profound effect on the kind of work he, you, one gets from it. You understand what I'm saying? And so if you look at these schedules, you can, you, you can see, a, so what we want is a lot of work from the person that doesn't require a lot of work on our part. Skinner used to say I'm the laziest person in the world. He wasn't, but he was making a point here. So the kind of reinforcement, let's go back to the PowerPoint that we're using here, is continuous reinforcement. The reinforcement is provided every time the person performs a desired behavior. Okay? This may be good for initiating a behavior. Okay? Right? You want it every time you do it, so the behavior becomes routine. But it has two major problems. First, it's not practical. And second, very fast extinction occurs when reinforcement stops. Extinction means, right, come back to me, the behavior is not, okay, you can leave it this way. Okay, the behavior is not reinforced, so I stop doing it. So, and you take an animal, hits the bar, give it food, 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 hits the bar, no food, it's by no, this is it, I'm out of this game, right? I'm not going to do this. Right? So extinction occurs means you don't reinforce it. So what I'm going to, what Skinner wants to do is to develop, let's go back to the PowerPoint, schedules of reinforcement, okay? <coughs> schedules of reinforcement that overcome those problems. He wants a practical way to do it, getting a lot of work that doesn't extinguish very fast. That you, that you don't, you can only have to reinforce every so often you get a lot of work. And so he has developed these schedules of reinforcement called ratio and interval schedules and fixed and variable schedules of reinforcement. Okay, come back to me. And we'll see to the extent to which these schedules do and don't enforce behavior. Okay? And Obviously, what we're going to try to do, Skinner is going to tell you reinforcement is the most effective. Because you saw what happens with punishment, right? Once in a while, behavioral psychology, by the way, this is used a lot with kids with autism and other things, behavioral changes, right? Applied behavioral analysis, it's often called. Once in a while, they'll say you have to punish a behavior if it's dangerous. Like kids who bang their head into the wall. There's been a lot of chalk about them. You know, People would give kids electric, mild electric chucks when they did that. People went nuts. Most of the parents approved. You know, it's like seeing your kids smash that into the wall, maybe get a concussion. They were but they said, but once, if, even if it's something extreme like that, the minute you do it, then you've got to start reinforcing what you want. We know that our schools are very punishment oriented. And Skinner says, that's a big mistake. You need to reinforce the behavior that you want. And next week, gee, I'm two minutes early. Next week, we will continue from here and talk about the schedules of reinforcement. Okay, see you then.